Welcome to the Empire Builders Podcast. Stephen, when you told me today's topic, part of me was like, oh, really? Are we going? And then part of me is like, which one of these guys is this? So, so you, <laughs> you said American Tobacco Company. Yes. I'm just going to have to jump on and follow along because I'm not a smoker, never have been. There's always been some interesting things prior to the 1970s, at least in tobacco advertising. So let's let's see what you got. We're going to talk about some of the things they did in the early stages, which is really amazing. But then they went on to do some really, really terrible business practices. They created this big conglomeration and they treated growers really terribly and did a lot of awful things and eventually got broken up because of the monopolistic nature that they were doing stuff. So there is a terrible history to American Tobacco Company, but the origin of the American Tobacco Company is really quite interesting and we can learn a lot. And and look, this is what this podcast is about. This podcast is about how did the empire get built in the early stages? Well, the innovative yeah. things that they did that was really cool and interesting, not the crappy things that they did later and the tobacco industry is a lot. So how far back are we turning the meter on the way back machine? 1870s. Oh, way back. Oh, and so we're in post-Civil War South where they're raising tobacco, just trying to set the stage and see where we're so post-Civil War. Yeah, you're right. This is going to get messy and weird. Yeah. And this is the company that really revolutionized the tobacco industry, right? Okay. Because what they did is they popularized the cigarette. Okay. Because at one time, cigarettes were less than 1% of tobacco sales. Today, they represent like 90% of tobacco sales. And and so back prior to this, it was it, I'm just trying to think of how tobacco use. It was a commodity crop and people what bought packaged tobacco and then did whatever, it rolled their own. Well, pipes were popular. Chewing tobacco was popular. Snuff and cigars were all popular. And in terms of pipe and chewing tobacco, what would happen is a wholesaler would buy tobacco from the growers and then would basically sell it to the stores. So there was really okay. no brand beyond the local. And again, most of it was cigars. Pipes was the most popular in chewing tobacco and, and snuff. Okay. And tobacco cigarettes at the time of the starting of this story was less than 1%. So basically a rounding error. Pre-rolled, pre-packaged cigarettes you could probably buy no you would still be buying it and rolling it yourself you'd be buying oh, really? the paper and rolling okay. it yourself yeah. yeah yeah there was probably some rolled around but you know again when it's such a small portion of the market it was hard to kind of figure out what the breakdown gotcha. of all those things were and this company american tobacco company was created by buck duke who at his peak went on to become the fifth richest man on the planet buck duke can you ask for a like a tougher name buck duke buck duke Yep. His middle name, Rock. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he's Duke University. Yeah. Duke, Duke University, same Duke. Same okay. Duke. This goes back to, you know, really the early days of America. Like in the 1870s, men, women, children, everyone was using tobacco. And it was assumed at this time, tobacco in all forms was good for you. That was the assumption. And this is how big tobacco use was. Tobacco was taxed. And it was so important that 30% of total tax revenues came from the tax on tobacco. Wow. Yeah. And as we talked about this time, there were no brands beyond local. So in comes Buck Duke, and he's a salesman on the road for the family business. The family has a tobacco shop called Pro Bono Publico. There's a great name, eh? Pro Why Bono wasn't it just Publico. Called Buck Dukes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. So he's on the road selling the tobacco and he's really struggling to find new customers. It's a, you know, it's very competitive. And he notices this, and this is a game changer. He notices that factory workers are smoking cigarettes on their break. Mm -hmm. And remember, cigarettes are considered a novelty item really for women at the time. But here's what he observed. Workers only get 10 minutes for a break which is yeah. not long enough to smoke a pipe or smoke mm -hmm. a cigar, but you could smoke a cigarette in that time. We're talking about a nicotine delivery system. Yes. Right. Yeah. So every, everybody's addicted to nicotine. And if you have a 10 minute break in your factory job, you need a quicker delivery system. And that's what he was observing, right? Yeah. And here's what he observed. You could literally smoke a cigarette in the time it takes to fill, tamp and light a pipe. Yeah. Forget a cigar, like a cigar oh, is like, 
cigars a long time. And this was right at the start of industrialization in America. So even this whole thing of people coming and working in factories was a fairly new thing. There was literally thousands of men working long hours with short breaks, but this trend was growing. Like the other part you could look at and go, there is going to be more factory workers and mm -hmm. they all have this short break. And he saw this as an opportunity. Yeah, huge opportunity. Yeah. Bro that's so this brilliant insight. This is what I really admired when I saw is that he saw this thing and he went that direction. So he decided to make cigarettes. So he hires the workforce he needs. He finds 125 cigarette rollers and brings them to North Carolina. And most of them are Jewish immigrants from Russia. Cigarettes are popular in Russia. And a good oh. roller could roll about four cigarettes in a minute. So he introduces pre-rolled cigarettes into the family shop. But he also needs to find a way to promote them elsewhere. And mm. so what he decides to do is to put baseball trading cards into the package as a freemium. Nice. So I don't know whether they were the first to do the baseball trading cards, but if they weren't the first, basically one of the first to do this whole idea of a trading card inside a product to help sell them. It used to be like chewing gum, right? That was the big thing with trading cards. So probably about the same time. But yeah, that's especially, gosh, you, you've got a product that people are, are because of the addiction, going to be buying over and over and over <laughs> you know, as, as long as they have the addiction or are alive. <laughs> the mindset was not that this was an addiction, right? No, it was, it was they enjoyed it. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And the other thing that was brilliant about putting the trading cards into a package of tobacco, it also protected the cigarettes during a transportation. So it actually solved a double, a double purpose. And they started to selling it under the brand W, Duke and Sons. And it becomes the first branded cigarettes in the country. He invests $800,000, which would be like tens oh, of millions today, into ads and cards. So they heavily promote this. And it works and the business grows. By 1884, he is selling 90 million cigarettes a year. Wow. It is so popular that they start falling behind in production. They're weeks behind in delivery, but they're at full capacity. They can't find more workers. They don't have space for more workers. So here's the next stroke of brilliance. Stay tuned. We're going to wrap up this story and tell you how to apply this lesson to your business right after this. There you are, Tommy. Got a second? Sure, Brian. What's up? I want to start advertising, but I'm not sure if TV or radio is better. Hmm, what about magazines, billboards, social media, direct mail? Oh, great. More choices. Thanks for your help. I know. It's frustrating. That's why I met with Stephen Semple. Stephen who? Stephen Semple, the guy with the podcast about business success. A podcast guy? Really, Tommy? That's crazy. Nope. It was awesome. He talked to me for 90 minutes about my business and gave me advice that I could use right away. Yeah? How much did that set you back? Nothing. Zip. Totally free. Some business guy gave you 90 minutes of his time and advice for free? That's crazy. He can help you too, Brian. Yeah, if he can help narrow the choices I'm in. Just sign up for a starter session. Go to TheEmpireBuildersPodcast.com. TheEmpireBuildersPodcast.com? Yep, just type in TheEmpireBuildersPodcast.com. Com. Let's pick up our story where we left off, and trust me, you haven't missed a thing. He comes across an idea that had been submitted in a competition, and it's an automated cigarette yes. rolling machine that was created by James Bonzac, okay. called the Bonzac Machine. It had won this competition, but the prize money was never awarded. He decides this is the solution. But he also wants to be closer to where the action is, and New York is emerging as the financial capital of the United States, so he decides to open a fully automated factory in New York. Mm. He bets heavy on it. Builds this factory, buys a bunch of the machines, borrows tons of money. So they're deeply in debt, and the machines don't work. Oh, no. In fact, they had the machines for months, and they're not working. It got to the stage where Buck almost lost the company. They reached the point where <laughs> they were out of cash, and they had $12,000 come and due. So he's staring down this debt challenge, he bet the future, and he's struggling to get these machines to frickin' work. Plus, there's no guarantee that even if they get the machine to work, that a mechanically rolled cigarette would sell. Mm. There's no guarantee. But he got the machine working. Okay. And when he got it working, this was a game changer. Single machine would roll 200 cigarettes in a minute, and he bought 24 of them. Oh, man. 
So it was basically doing the same amount of work. These 24 machines are doing the same amount of work that over a thousand workers would do. He could make 824 million cigarettes in a year. Within a year, he's controlling 90% of the cigarette market. And by 1890, he's basically 10% of the market. It's enough that it moves them into one of the top five tobacco companies. That's amazing. That's amazing. And in my mind, as you tell all this, I'm, I got to wonder, and this, I know this isn't part of the story, but what happened to the, the Russian Jewish people that, that uh, he, he, he moved out? Are they still there? Did they follow him back to New York? What has, I know it's not part of the story, though. I'm going to, um, given some of the things he did later as he got larger, he was unbelievably ruthless. I'm going to assume he just fired those people. I'm guessing that there's probably a really cool historical podcast that's covered. Why are there Jews in North? Is it North Carolina, or South Carolina? North Carolina. North Carolina. Why? How did they get there? Right? It's like, oh, well. <laughs> this is meet, how. <laughs> meet, meet Buck Duke. <laughs> yeah, so there's certain more. He decides he wants to get even bigger. So he goes on a price war because he has this big price advantage due to automation. And he gets to the point where he bullies the other tobacco companies to join forces with them. And he makes a deal to have them all fall under a conglomerate umbrella, American Tobacco. This was the first company to do this whole idea of pull together a whole pile of people to really control the business. Now, it does get broken up under antitrust legislation later, but, you know, Buck Duke popularized the cigarette yeah. through this observation of this thing that he saw going on. Here's the ironic thing. He hated cigarettes. He hated cigarettes. He was not a cigarette smoker, never became a cigarette smoker, didn't like cigarettes. He enjoyed smoking a cigar. He yeah. was never a cigarette smoker. That's the irony in it. This is the whole thing. How many times have we heard stories where the real lesson here is observing a consumer behavior and filling that need, mm -hmm. saying, wow, you know, this is what the consumer is looking for. And it's never from a focus group interview. It's never like, hey, you know, we've interviewed consumers and consumers say they want cigarettes. It was from watching the world and then seeing two trends. Not only these consumers, there's going to be a lot more of these consumers over time because we are industrializing. People wanted to use some tobacco during their short little time period that they had in a 10-minute break. This all comes down to removing some friction, right? Uh, there's some friction in how to use a tobacco product in a short period of time. And man, uh, cigarettes still fill that need. They do. They do to this day. You see anybody that still smokes, you see them duck out for a quick cigarette break. Five, 10 minutes, they're back. Absolutely. It's this whole thing of being really attuned to the needs of your customer and the changes that are going on. And as you said, eliminating those frictions, making things easier, more convenient, more accessible. And even when you're in the service industry and in some podcasts in the future where, where service providers have also done that same thing of making mm -hmm. it easier and just observing that consumer behavior and consumer desire and seeing an unfilled need and filling it. And then his next innovation was automating, mm -hmm. right? Coming across this machine and going, we should automate this process. Now, maybe he would have been better to buy one machine and get it working before building the factory <laughs> and, you know, being 24 of them. You know, we might be telling a very different business if things had tipped just a slightly different direction. But I still have to give him credit for seeing that because it would be easy to sit there and go, oh, no. Tobacco has to be hand-rolled because we've always done it that way. How often have we yeah. heard businesses, oh, no, we've always done it that way. He was very innovative, very, you know, looking out at the world and bringing those things to the business. And look, it turned him into, at the peak, he was the fifth wealthiest man on the planet. An industrialist. One of, one of his eras, I don't know, we didn't call them oligarchs back then, but when he takes his talent and, and then starts to control the industry that he's in, that's when things are not as good. The early days are where I admire them. Yeah, uh, no, I, I admire the innovation, the the, the yes. antitrust. The, you know, the, the, basically they build these big. They call them trusts. That's why we we don't think about it. we think of antitrust and we don't think of breaking up corporations. But it's these industries that gang together and did pricing together. Right? They weren't necessarily all owned together, but they cooperated as competitors in a way that kept all the other competitors out. And I think they called the organization a trust. It happened, in, it happened in the whiskey world, right? Yeah, 
Happens in a lot of industries. That used yeah. to confuse me. I used to think, well, the antitrust, I don't you know, because we think trust today. We think, oh, well, you know, uh, grandpa's got a trust that he's leaving. <laughs> it's like it's right. not that kind of trust. <laughs> right. So Duke University has got an interesting uh, background when it comes to all of this stuff as well. <laughs> Go Big Tobacco. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great story. Interesting take on innovation. Just, you know, one of those products that's, uh, yeah. Not as popular today as it used to be, thankfully. I, I, I enjoyed learning about it. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Thanks, David. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please share us. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave us a big, fat, juicy five-star rating and review. And if you have any questions about this or any other podcast episode, email to questions at the Empire Builders Podcast.com. <laughs>